it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Never go looking for urban legends. If you're looking for a story with a happy or otherwise fulfilling ending, I'd advise you to look elsewhere. Now, with that being said, if you need a stern warning why we shouldn't dabble in the unknown, then listen on. The autumn of 1997 was an eventful time for me. For the umpteenth time, my life changed as I found myself ripped away from my friends when my family moved yet again. It was also the year I came face to face with the Witherer. This time our destination was the suburbs of Pennsylvania. This was a welcome change from the hustle and bustle of city life. For the first time in my life, I could see trees from my window. Not just trees lining a filthy street either, but an actual forest with animals. I was a happy child growing up. I enjoyed all the perks of being from a wealthy family and made friends easily. The only common disturbance came when being moved from city to city on account of my father's work as a sales agent. We never stayed in one place for more than a few years. Despite fitting in well, having to make new friends each time we moved proved to be an emotionally taxing task. For years I anxiously awaited my senior year only for disappointment to find me again. I was just getting settled into my previous school in Virginia when my parents set me down to reveal we'd be moving again. Oh, I wasn't enthused by the idea of starting over during the biggest year of my life to date. Like clockwork, I found myself being called the new kid once more. Well, being the new kid did have its advantages, though. For one, I was always the centre of attention, at least for about a week until gossip and rumours dispelled the shroud of mystery surrounding me. You see, uh, you're not the new kid when everyone learns your name. But, to my surprise and delight, I immediately made friends with the most popular guy in the school, Charlie Rennick. Without fail, I found myself invited to all the best house parties every single weekend. Now, Charlie loved partying, so much so that it was the only thing he ever talked about. Well, this made it even more surprising when he spent the entire lunch period nerding out and regurgitating an urban legend about a witch from the 1700s. Now, according to Charlie, the Witherer was a soothsayer whose inaccurate fortune-telling got her beat to near death by local villagers. The hate-driven mob didn't know what care that she was pregnant, though. After her inevitable miscarriage, the solemn woman locked herself away in her cabin to wither and die. Charlie's agitation was palpable when he heard me laugh off his elaborate fairy tale as if it was a lousy joke. Oh, we'll see who's laughing after we go through the ritual tomorrow, Charlie said, clearly annoyed by my antics. A ritual? What? <laughs> you like twelve? This is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard, I retorted, still egging him on. Well, I'd gotten him going by that point. Charlie spent the next ten minutes describing the ritual he'd learned about from his stoner cousin Jerry in great detail. I didn't take his tale very seriously. Jerry was 37 and lived in his mum's basement, after all. But in hindsight, I should have. According to Charlie, the legend says that if you drive for exactly 27 minutes on Lost Hollow Road at 1.13am, your car will stall. At that point, you need to exit your vehicle and walk westward through the woods for three miles. At precisely 2.44 a.m., you'll reach the cabin of the Witherer. Don't stop walking until you reach the dwelling. Once you arrive, you're to knock on the door twice before turning around the way you came, as if you were leaving. No, you don't actually leave, though. Instead, a voice will beckon you inside. Upon entering, the Witherer will ask you to solve a riddle. If you answer the riddle correctly, you get to make a wish. And no matter how absurd the wish is, it'll come true. Marching through the woods in search of ghosts was not my idea of a fun Saturday night. But I didn't want to see Charlie getting mauled by a bear either. I let out a sigh, and against my better judgment, I agreed. Fine, I'll go with you. 
but only so you don't have to trek around the woods alone at odd hours. The obnoxious ringing of the lunch bell cut our conversation short, and after shaking Charlie's hand to seal the deal, I headed off to my afternoon classes. I spent the rest of chemistry and physics daydreaming about what I'd wish for if the ritual was legitimate. Would I wish for an endless fortune, a movie star wife, fame? On the off chance the witherer turned out to be real, she could grant me any of those. The next day flew by as I concocted my exact wish and read up on different riddles. I also spent over an hour peering at various maps, trying to find Lost Hollow Road. No matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find it anywhere. I concluded that it must be one of the many unmarked gravel roads going up into the mountains. When the time to pick up Charlie finally rolled around, he emerged from his house with a bulky camera, presumably to take a picture of the fabled cabin in the woods. Jerry said it was this one, Charlie said, pointing to a road highlighted red on his map. This confirmed my suspicion. It was indeed a mountain road, and was also most likely private property. We pulled up to the unmarked gravel road at 1.02am, and cut off the motor to wait. Eventually we got talking about what we'd wish for. Charlie said he'd wish to be richer than Bill Gates, and monopolised the next ten minutes describing how he'd spend his billions. Well, his rambling left me no time to tell him about my wish, but I let it go because mine wasn't anywhere near as interesting anyway. So at exactly 1.13am, I began the drive down Lost Hollow Road. After around ten minutes, the radio was cutting in and out. I chalked this up to the elevation and the dense forest canopy above. By the fifteen-minute mark, my headlights were flickering in and out, and I became worried that we'd have to turn around when I could barely see the road. Despite this strange mechanical malfunction, we pressed on down the ever-narrowing road. After a few more minutes of driving, it was clear that turning around wasn't an option anymore. I can't say for sure, but each time the lights went out, I swear I could see erratic, jerky movements ahead of me. Charlie was becoming restless by the twenty-minute mark. The condition of the road was getting worse at a rapid pace. It was crystal clear to both of us that nobody used this road anymore, let alone high school kids in Honda Civic. Maybe uh, we should turn back, he suggested in a crestfallen tone. And just where do you suggest I do that, you moron? Which side of the mountain do you want me to drive off? I snapped at him. After the harsh scolding, Charlie began smouldering quietly in the passenger seat. Despite being mad as hell at the situation we were in, I pressed on, ignoring the reptilian-like sense of self-preservation ingrained in us all. I continued braving the winding, crater-ridden road for a few more minutes before my car stalled and came to a halt in the middle of the road. A quick check of my watch revealed that, to my absolute horror, 27 minutes had passed since we started down the road. Charlie got out of the car and began walking into the tree line. Something wasn't adding up. The ritual was working too well. Are you insane? I yelled at him petrified at the prospect of following him. He didn't answer, and instead continued to wander deeper into the woods. With great reluctance, I followed suit. As we ventured blindly into the pitch-black forest, I could tell right away there was something wrong with the place. No animals or insects were making a noise. Instead, there was only an eerie hum that befell the entire forest. After what felt like forever, my heart sank as a derelict-looking cabin appeared in the maze of trees. The orange hue of a candle illuminated one window as we crept towards it. There it is! Charlie shouted. Charlie lifted his camera and snapped a quick photo of the cabin before stuffing the Polaroid in his pocket. Oh, it is real, I thought to myself as I swallowed hard and tried to muster up every drop of courage in my body. This time it was me who wandered forward. Checking my watch yet again in the candlelight radiating from the window, I saw that it was now 2.44am. It was now or never. Without missing a beat, 
I gave the door two firm knocks with my open palm before turning around to see Charlie staring onwards, slack jawed. You may enter. An ancient sounding voice hissed at us from inside. Charlie and I lurched through the threshold in abject terror. The interior of the one-room cabin was plain and otherwise unremarkable, except for the single chair in the centre. A dim, lone candle stood next to the chair, illuminating all but the corners of the structure. For the life of me, I couldn't tell which corner of the room the voice was coming from. I couldn't help but wretch at the horrible stench. The smell of sulphur and rotting meat tickled my nostrils as the disembodied voice spoke again. Sit and answer well. Before I could react, Charlie pushed me aside and sat in the chair. He scanned the room anxiously as a dark, thin figure emerged from the shadows. The figure that emerged and stood before Charlie was once human, but wasn't any more. She was rotten, her flesh melted from her bones. What remained of her ancient skin clung to her fragile bones like plastic wrap. Where her eyes should have been, there were dark, eyeless caverns. The witherer is real, I thought, overwhelmed by a sick sense of dread and anticipation. Make your wish, but do not speak it. Answer true and I shall grant it, the witherer rasped. The room froze in silence for a moment, before she spoke yet again. I am lovely in the sun, but wilt when left in the dark. What am I? Charlie looked onwards in shock before letting out a cackle and saying, Seriously? That's the infamous riddle? I took in the pungent air and breathed a deep sigh of relief. A flower? Charlie decreed proudly. In that instant, Charlie's confident sneer twisted into a look of sheer agony as he collapsed to the floor, writhing in pain as his teeth fell from his mouth. His nails were next to go as they slid from his fingers, then his flesh blackened with lesions that oozed pus and thick black blood. Finally, his flesh turned to a liquid and dripped from his bones in chunks. I froze and watched in horror as my best friend withered away into a heap of human sludge. I knew then that Charlie had guessed wrong, and I only hoped I could guess correctly. Within a few seconds, nothing remained of Charlie except a pile of gruel and bone. My heart raced as I prepared myself to die as best I could. The witherer turned to me next and asked the same riddle that sealed Charlie's gruesome fate. Well, to this day I couldn't tell you what force compelled me to say it, but before I could even think of an answer I blurted out, The witherer! Well, the agonizing death that I was awaiting never came. Instead the world around me went cold and black. The force of slamming into the wooden floor woke me up, and I frantically scanned my surroundings. But instead of the witherer's cabin, I was in a normal-looking bedroom, laying on a hardwood floor. And to my surprise, I wasn't dead yet. There was no pungent odour, no pile of remains, or any whispering crones. I had no idea where I was, but I was thankful to be alive. Instead, there was the smell of freshly cooked bacon and the soft voice of a woman calling out from downstairs. Charlie, breakfast is ready. My heart skipped a beat as I remembered Charlie with his camera as I reached into my pocket and pulled out a crinkled up photograph of a dimly lit cabin in the forest. And at that moment, I knew. I knew that I'd answered correctly and gotten my wish. I was now the most popular kid in school. And to this day, I'm not sure if the hardest part of being Charlie is actually living his life or if it was seeing my own missing persons posters plastered around town. So, 
Take it from someone who's been living a lie for the last 23 years. Never go looking for the witherer. My dream home won't stop bleeding. I grew up poor, no two ways about it. My family did everything they could to get by, but it was rarely enough. When I was a kid, the other children bullied me no end. I didn't have many friends. My parents were never around either, on account of working at least two jobs at a time. I couldn't blame them. They were trying to keep whatever shitty apartment we happened to live in at the time. I never worked, though. The eviction notices were constant. We could never seem to get ahead in life. The fondest memory of my childhood was when my parents bought their first home. I was 16 at the time and wanted nothing more than to belong somewhere. This was right after my father got a promotion to foreman at the construction company he worked for. Well, I didn't live there long. Not even two years, but for the first time in my life, I felt as though I belonged somewhere. My parents were happy too. For once in our life, we didn't have to worry about money. I left my parents' home when I graduated high school to attend college on an academic scholarship. I'd always done well in school, despite my unpopularity. I would later graduate at the top of my class and begin my career in finance. After a few years of working my ass off and living like a cloistered monk, I saved enough money to get a home of my own. I longed for the feeling that I'd felt when my parents had bought their house. In no time I found out that searching for homes was an abysmal disappointment. I even got to experience a very familiar feeling. Everything I wanted was well out of my price range. Demoralized, I was ready to consign myself to a dump of a place, so long as it was close to work. It would be a step above my efficiency apartment, after all. But then I discovered a glimmer of hope. I found a gorgeous old home in my price range. The only unfortunate thing being its distance from my job. Well, I could live with that. It was a real steal. The house shown in the ad was constructed in a breathtaking Victorian style. It stood two stories tall and was painted in an eye-catching shade of crimson. There was an iron fence outside and a post where an old-timey sign had once hung. It was filled with long hallways, high ceilings and twisting spiral staircases. It even had a chandelier. It was everything that I'd ever wanted. Oh, the events following my discovery of the ad are all a blur. I closed on the house and moved in within a month of finding it. The seller was an elderly woman. She seemed keen on selling it as soon as possible. I bought the home for $40,000 under value. It was the deal of a lifetime. Moving all alone was a pain in the ass, but otherwise uneventful. I didn't even have enough possessions to fill the house. Several rooms were left empty. For the first week, I was in a constant state of awe. It felt even better than when my parents had bought their house. I basked in the warm feeling of homeliness that I was experiencing. But then the strange occurrences started. Small things being out of place characterized these first incidents. Never an item that you'd expect to misplace them, like car keys or my wallet. Oh, they were strange things like the plunger ending up in the dining room or pillows turning up in the kitchen. Following these strange happenings, I began double-checking my locks every night. I suspected one of the neighborhood kids had been pranking me while I was at work. Well, I admit this was a bit of a stretch considering that my nearest neighbor was half a mile away. To my surprise, it continued to occur. Over time, the situation got even weirder. Cabinet doors would open by themselves, the occasional tap would come on without warning. Sometimes lights would turn off. Every now and again, the thermostat would adjust itself. I didn't know what to make of this. I'm not superstitious, so I figured that someone was getting in through the windows. And this, of course, alarmed me. But it was easy enough to remedy. Upon inspection of the windows, I found some of them unlocked. I dealt with this in swift fashion by installing locks on every window, even on the second floor. No one would get into my house now. Over the course of the following weeks, things got worse. Much worse. Doors slammed shut, footsteps roamed the halls, and I swear I could hear whispers at night. 
I hadn't considered the possibility of my house being haunted, until one day, when the wall started bleeding. I was sitting at my kitchen table when it first happened. From the corner of my eye, I noticed a wet, crimson substance oozing from the walls in the hallway. When I turned to face it, I saw, plain as day, that there was blood seeping from my wall. It wasn't a deluge of blood, though. It was as though the house had broken out in a steady, heavy sweat. In a state of shock, I tried to wipe it away, but as I did, it disappeared as the rag touched it. It wasn't corporeal at all. Instead, it was like it was an illusion. As I tried to wipe it away, the phenomena would begin somewhere else. The blood collected on the floor and pooled on the hardwood floor before vanishing. I was never religious or superstitious, but I ran to my cell phone with haste and dialed up a local church. A man named Father Ferelli picked up. The bleeding stopped while I was on the phone with a priest. Still, I explained to him that something was wrong and that I needed help. He comforted me over the phone and showed up the following day to bless the house. This surprised me, considering that I wasn't a member of his congregation, nor was I religious. He didn't even know me. It turned out that it hadn't been the first time he'd been to this house. The old woman who'd owned the house before me had many similar complaints at first. Well, this greatly reassured me. I now knew that I wasn't crazy. Still, though, I didn't like what he had to say one bit. He told me that there was something wrong with the house on a fundamental level. That a previous owner must have committed heinous deeds. This was a mortal issue, one that God had no whim to fix. Despite Father Ferelli's reservations, he did as I asked. He went from room to room, blessing the entire house. Upon completion of this task, he told me that moving was the only actual solution. According to the priest, my house was very sick. According to him, something truly horrible had to have happened here. In the weeks following the blessing, things only got worse. The whispers turned into crystal clear voices. They conversed with each other at all hours. They ruminated over what sounded like outdated medical procedures. After a few weeks of pondering what Father Ferelli had said, I decided I was going to move away. No harm had come to me, but I was unwilling to wait around for it to happen. My house was clearly haunted. Not long after deciding, I began seeing people in my house. They wore Victorian-era clothes and they like the walls bled from every orifice. They always appeared to be mutilated in different ways. Some were missing limbs, some had no eyes, tongue or teeth, while others were disemboweled. No matter what fate these beings met, they always had a hollow, emotionless expression. It was truly haunting, especially when i catch one in the mirror. The horrific entities would wander the halls around the clock. They never spoke to me or even acknowledged my existence. The only thing they ever did was wander the halls as if lost. Well, I'm not sure when it started, but at some point, I would walk into rooms and see them doing abhorrent things. They would mutilate each other with a slew of tools, all while wearing blank expressions. Once I went into my bathroom to brush my teeth, only to be greeted by the empty visage of one of these spectral men. He had long hair, a thin moustache, a scarred face, and wore a tall, black top hat. In his right hand, he brandished a rusty, gnarled-looking hacksaw. I wanted to run more than anything, but instead of running, I stood there paralyzed. It was as if something had rooted me to the floor. I was aghast and horrified at what I saw happen next. He approached a woman in a long white dress who was kneeling over my bathtub. She held out a dainty hand to him, which he took and, to my horror, carved through from fingertip to wrist with his sword. He hacked through her flesh and bone, his face contorting in an unnaturally wide grin. His grin became so wide that his mouth fell open, revealing that his mouth was slit from ear to ear. Despite his enjoyment, he remained silent as death. I was still in shock as the woman got up. Her face bore no emotion at all. Instead of writhing in agony, she turned and walked down the hall, allowing thick, dark blood to pour from her mangled hand as she descended the spiral staircase. 
The sadistic man then stood up, sore in hand. He made his way down the hall shortly afterward, walking directly through me. As his spectral form passed through mine, a visceral chill shot through my body. This caused me to shiver violently. He didn't even realize or seem to care that I watched him commit this vile deed. At that moment, I found myself freed from my temporary stasis. I turned from my bathroom and sprinted down the stairs to leave this forsaken house. I couldn't take the never-ending horrors anymore. When I went to grab my car keys, I found only an ancient-looking photo where they usually sat on my kitchen counter. The sepia tone resembled old Wild West photos that I remembered from history classes. Upon closer inspection of the photo, I noticed that it was the same man I'd seen moments ago. He was standing in front of my home, I dressed head to toe in all black. He held the same rusty hacksaw he'd used to split the woman's hand. Next to him was a wooden sign that said, Dr. Johannes Fleischmann, General Surgeon. Being so engrossed in the photo, I didn't notice that my keys had been sitting next to it. After snapping back to reality, I grabbed them and got into my car. While in my car, I called the real estate company. I needed to figure out how to contact the old woman who'd sold me the house. She had to have answers. Well, I confirmed my theory when I got contact information for the previous owner from the realtor. After a several hour long conversation, I found out that my house had been a doctor's office in the 1850s. It had served as something much worse later on. Dr. Johannes Fleischmann opened his practice in 1851. He worked out of the house until 1857. That was when the authorities caught him performing amputations without cause. He would give false medical advice and tell people the only way to cure them was to operate. Disgraced, Fleischmann quit practicing medicine and instead opened a new business. His new career was much more macabre than even what he did beforehand. Fleischmann's new business was a parlor where people could go to to spectate torches. It's alleged that there are dozens of bodies buried on the property, but no one ever cared to look. Oh, the good doctor was cunning. He only ever took those who didn't have family in the surrounding towns. Still, despite his careful measures, one family did discover what was going on. Yeah, the doctor had gotten careless in 1873 and kidnapped a young girl named Annie. Annie's father was an unhinged war veteran who long suspected the doctor's crimes. One night he broke into the home, and legend has it that he caught the doctor in the act. Annie's father stabbed Fleischmann almost 100 times but that was after cutting his mouth from ear to ear with a glass bottle. None of the crimes have ever been confirmed, though. According to the town records, Dr. Johannes Fleischmann died peacefully in his home. No one ever asked questions, seeing as he was loathed by the townsfolk. Well, the woman who'd sold me the home disclosed none of this for obvious reasons. She informed me that the apparitions are harmless, but they never stop. She also told me that they would get worse the longer I stayed, and to prepare myself for that. It's obvious that these events were true. The doctor's victims had never left this house, and they never will. Instead, damnation and ceaseless torment await them in the house's haunted halls. Well, I'm trying to sell the house. It's been on the market for almost a year now, and no one's showing any interest. I don't care about losing money on it at this point. I just want it gone. The only problem is that I can't bring myself to not disclose the home's sordid past. Every time a potential buyer arrives, I tell them the truth. I let them know that the house is sick. So for now, the home remains my problem. The apparitions are only getting worse, and day by day, I can feel insanity creeping up on me. made a horrifying discovery in my brother's basement. Growing up, my twin brother David and I were always very close. Our parents divorced when we were teenagers, leading to our separation. I went to live with our mother while David remained with our father. 
During this separation, we did our best to stay in contact, but our parents' avoidance of each other meant that we didn't see much of the other. When we graduated from high school, we attended the same college and became close yet again, even being roommates for a few semesters. Oh, I couldn't take it after a while, though. He was always such a clean freak and had some OCD tendencies. Oh, my brother and I didn't share his OCD sentiments. I'm not a dirty or crude person by any means, but my brother and I have very different living habits. Eventually, this led to me moving in with the girl I was seeing. Not my finest hour, but it was a lesson learned. David reached out to me last Thursday, asking me to watch his new house while he was out of town on a business trip. Not a daunting task in the slightest, but it meant a lot to him. he just moved into a new house and was ecstatic about it. Well, I agreed without hesitation. Now, in addition to his OCD, my brother has always been a bit paranoid bit of a weirdo. Because of his paranoia, he, upon graduation from college, moved into one of those suburbs where everyone's home looks the same. The development even has a neighbourhood watch made up of like-minded, paranoid characters. And trivial things like that reassured my brother to an extent, but he still had his entire property wired with cameras, even inside the house. Well, it took me several passes of the neighbourhood to determine which house was his. I really wasn't kidding when I said they all looked the same. Eventually I found his house. I parked up my beat-up old car in the garage. I didn't want to leave it in the driveway, lest the neighbours determine it to be an eyesore and call the cops on me. Reaching for the doorknob, I noticed a handwritten note on the door. It read, Remove your shoes, please. What a freaking weirdo, I thought. Upon entering his house, I discovered that it was in pristine condition. There were even plastic coverings still on the furniture. The paint on the walls was pearly white. It appeared almost as though the house was unoccupied. In the kitchen, I found yet another note on the counter. There was a list of rules written on it. Russell, please make yourself at home, but please respect these rules. It would make me feel a lot better if you did. 1. Please remove your shoes. 2. Please ensure the doors remain locked at all times. 3. Please watch for any suspicious activity on the cameras. 4. Do not remove any of the plastic coverings from the furniture. 5. Please stay out of the basement. It's not finished yet, and the contractor says it's still a mess. We wouldn't want anyone getting hurt. Still the same old David. Locking the door I'd entered through, I made my way to the fridge to get a beer. While I planned ahead, I made sure David picked me up a case of my favourite brew in exchange for me watching the house. The beer in hand, I made my way to the living room to find something on TV. Well, to my surprise, there were two TVs. The first one was small and mounted to the wall. It had several camera feeds displayed on it, including one that showed me sitting on the couch, looking at the monitor. God, I wish he could just be normal. Well, I admit it. It was weird watching myself on the camera feed, but surveillance wasn't new behaviour on David's part. David's second TV is one of the massive, curved 4K Ultra HD ones. The setup was pretty sweet, and I had to admit, my goofy-ass twin brother had a nice place. The only annoying part about staying in the brand new home was the fact that I kept sticking to his couch on account of the plastic cover. Everything was great. The beers were cold, and the TV was crystal clear. That is, until that maddening, dripping sound started. It was so damn agitating. It was as though someone was standing right next to me, slowly wringing out a sopping wet towel. Turning to the camera monitor, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. I just turned the TV up to drown out the sound of the annoying noise. It worked for a short time, until it got louder. I was getting tired and knew I wouldn't be able to sleep with that annoying noise. After nearly an hour of searching the house for leaky pipes, I gave up momentarily and I remembered that the basement was still undergoing renovations. 
Maybe he had a crap pint. If that were the case, it wouldn't be right for me to just let it go. It could cause some expensive damage if it was left unattended. The basement itself was a large, empty room with unfinished drywall and concrete floors. I went to flick the light switch on, but it didn't work. Thinking the lights had yet to be wired, I pulled out my cell phone and turned on my flashlight. Using it to scan the room, I noticed a dripping, exposed pipe right above an oddly placed porcelain tub in the room's corner. Well, I've always been handy, and I keep a set of tools in my truck at all times, so I decided I'd fix the leaky pipe for David. Within a few minutes, I'd fixed it and was ready to go back to binge-watching TV. But as I turned round, I noticed something bizarre. In the far corner, there was a small box TV sitting on the floor. And to my surprise, it had turned on on its own. Crackling static filled the screen and caused it to illuminate that part of the room. Overwhelmed by curiosity, I made my way over to it. It wasn't like David to keep an old TV around at all, let alone in the corner of his basement on the cold concrete floor. There was no way he was actually using the thing. As I got closer, I noticed a VCR along with a stack of VHS tapes sitting next to it. Hmm. I wonder what that weirdo was watching down here. Probably some kind of nasty 80s porn. The tapes were all unlabeled, and I was curious, so I slipped one in. And it was just surveillance footage from around the house. Well, bizarre as things go. I fast-forwarded through it for a while. So it was just a camera feed footage from his backyard. Well, it was uneventful, but it still made me feel very uneasy. What would David possibly have to be so worried about? After fast-forwarding some more, I grew bored and flipped on another tape. God, I wish I hadn't. This tape started off much like the first one. Just boring surveillance footage of the backyard. Then a woman walked across the yard. Next thing I knew, a figure in all black grabbed her from behind and forced her to the ground. He seemed to stab her in the neck with something and she quickly stopped resisting. The dark figure picked her up off the ground and walked right towards the camera. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach. The camera sits above the back door. The tape cut to black and I turned to walk out of the basement. I was going to go home now to call the police. But as I turned my back, the TV screen lit up again and the most horrifying shriek I've ever heard assailed my ears. Spinning around, I saw a ghastly sight on the small screen. The camera pointed towards a naked struggling woman, chained in a bathtub. She was badly beaten and cuts adorned her entire body. Moments later, the man in black came into the room and poured what appeared to be honey all over her. And he then dumped a bucket of large cockroaches into the tub. The bugs swarmed the woman, crawling all over her new body as she screamed at the top of her lungs, begging for help. I sat there, peering mindlessly into the TV both engrossed and sickened by what I was watching. The video then transitioned to a time-lapse video of the bugs eating her. The timestamp on the film showed that it took two days for her to stop twitching. She screamed for a while, at least until the bugs crawled down her throat and began eating her from the inside out. It took four days for the insects to devour her flesh completely. That poor woman was eaten alive by roaches. And this tape was in my brother's house. I was speechless, unwilling to put two and two together. I wanted to call the police right then, but macabre curiosity got the better of me as I slid the next tape into the VCR. Somehow the next tape was even worse, probably because it proved without doubt that my brother was responsible for these horrific killings. The next tape saw him drag a woman from his living room into the basement's direction. The tape cut to black again, much like the first one. This time, I waited for it to resume. There was a woman in the same tub as the first tape, bound in the same way. 
Suddenly a man appeared in the frame. It was my brother. He wasn't wearing a mask this time. After having his way with a poor woman, he started raving about how she was dirty and needed cleansed. Couldn't watch any more, but for some sick reason I couldn't force myself to look away. Like a zombie, I started onward as my brother dumped bleach all over the woman and scrubbed her with a steel wall. I'll spare the details of where on her body he started, but by the end of it, her body resembled spaghetti. It appeared as though she passed out from blood loss when my brother began violating her again, smearing himself in her blood as he did. I had to hold back from vomiting as he did this. How would I call this lunatic my brother? And somehow, the woman began screaming again. David screamed furiously at her, demanding that she shut up. When she didn't, he picked up a hatchet from the floor and began hacking her apart with an anvil, a murderous glint in his eye. Finally, the crazed hacking ceased and David began throwing her body parts into heavy plastic bags before rushing over to the camera to tear it off. Had he always been like this? A deranged murderer. Feverishly, I slid another tape into the VCR, hoping to find the answer. The next tape was the worst yet. It showed David yet again kidnapping a woman, violating her and torturing her. But the way he did it still haunts me. He began by pulling out her teeth with a pair of pliers. I could hear the cracking of bone and the twisting of gums as he did it. Next, he took a small paring knife and scalped her before walking out of the room with his totem in hand. This woman continued to scream for at least 30 minutes before David entered the frame again. This time he was wearing her scalp and hair. The long black hair partially obscured his face as he approached her while holding a drill. I kicked the TV hard, knocking it over and shattering the screen. I couldn't take it any more. I could still hear the screams coming from the TV, even though the image was no longer there. I rushed up the stairs, not even thinking to grab the six more tapes still sitting on the floor, which would surely be damning evidence. I made it to my truck and booked it out of the garage and prepared to dial 911, but before I could, my cell phone lit up with a text from David. I'm leaving so soon, it read. I ignored the message and called the police right away. They had to get a search warrant. And that process took too long and, as a result, they never found the tapes. The sole piece of evidence retrieved was a broken tube television. I haven't spoken to my brother in seven years. I don't plan on speaking to him ever again. He deserves to rot for the things he's done. I'm writing this because... I just received a package in the mail. It was a tape. The footage on it was of me sitting in that godforsaken basement, staring into the TV. Scrawled on the tape in Sharpie was, Seven years ago today. Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.